morning and uh, welcome to Central Christian Church. Hey, one thing that I am excited about is announcing uh, our board's decision to go back to uh, indoor uh, live worship services on March 21st. So it's been a long it's been a long wait to get to that point. I'm glad that we are, are approaching it. Um, there are instructions online on how we're going to handle that, and we are also going to get a, a letter out uh, to you this week. So uh, that's an answer to prayer, and let, let's continue to pray that God will just guide us through that and uh, help us to, uh, to restart in a, uh, at a reasonable time and in, in a good way. So I'm looking forward to that. Hey, I want to thank um, all of you for supporting the Brackney family. We had a funeral on Friday for Joan Brackney and Larry and Judy Chrysler were invited to represent us. The service was just a, a private one for the family. Um, but that service is online. If there are any of our members who are friends with, with Joan and want to watch that service, it's online at the uh, Conroy Funeral Home. But uh, again, thank you for supporting the, uh, the Brackneys. Hey, let me say an opening prayer, and then we will go ahead and get started. Father, I thank you for this day. Thank you for this place, the opportunity we have to be, to be worshiping today. Uh, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide each aspect of the service. Uh, Lord, I pray that people would hear the service in ways that, that help all of us to be more like Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Good morning. So if you guys see me fidgeting around, I realized this morning um, after a, a day full of sledding in the snow and getting very wet um, that my boots are still wet from last night. So if you see me moving around or like dancing or something, don't worry, I'm not getting too into it. It's the boots. So by a show of hands, who here is confused by the Trinity? All right, I see one, two, three. I can't see... Dan or Lauren. So about three-fifths. I'll assume it's the same as you're visiting us from home. I don't understand it. Um, the, the answer I've always gotten is we can't understand it. We're, we're human beings and he is God, um, which is a little bit um, dissatisfying. But um, a, as I, I sit in my basement working for the last year, um, I am reminded of uh, isolation. Um, I'm reminded of uh, feeling just very, like, trapped. Um, but what I always hope for um, and try and lean into is the fact that uh, there is a Holy Spirit, um, that when you make the decision to follow Christ, it, uh, um, we're welcoming that, that Spirit of Christ, that Spirit of God that is somehow God, is somehow Christ, but then living within us. So um, we, we get some of that from uh, John 14. So I'm going to read that with us, uh, everyone, this morning. <clears throat> if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, but I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me, because I live, you also live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. <clears throat> Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So I was reading that last night, and I heard a song that I've either never heard it before or I haven't heard it for a really long time. So um, we're going to open with that one. It's called God With Us. Um, so that's kind of my reminder to say I've never done this one before, and I learned it last night. So be, uh, be forgiving. Um, but it, it really, to me, speaks to, um, as we head into Easter, that, that we we follow a God who lives with us. He knows what it's like to walk down the road. He knows what it's like to love. He knows what it's like to lose. He knows what pain feels like in isolation. Um, and there, there aren't many things that offer that. The, the thing that, that saves us from the situation we're in, the situation of death and loss, is the same thing that, w that walked that and knows it intimately. So 
Um, so that, that's kind of a lead into our song today. So um, we actually have lyrics this week, so um, feel free to sing along. Oh, you've come to bring peace, to be love, to be nearer to us. So oh, you've come to bring life, to be light. To shine brighter in us, so we met you well, God, with us. Our deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence, we find our strength over every. Our redemption, God, with us. Oh, you've come to be home to this world for your honor and name. And you've come to take sin, to bear shame. The grave, oh, we man you well, God with us, our deliverer, you are Savior. In your presence, we find our strength over everything. Our Please pray with me. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you f for the chance that we have, even remotely, to, to join together and, and, and sing some songs and learn more about you. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you that we don't have a God who's, who's distant, but we have a God who's with us. And through that, we have connection to every person watching today, every person in the building here, every person who's not watching but that, that lives in you. And you, you say that those who love you love the Father 
because of that, the Father loves us, loves Christ, and Christ loves us. And we, we, live, we get to live in Him here on earth, but then ultimately in heaven. So God, God, I pray that I will find peace in that. I pray that I will find hope. I pray that that will be an encouragement every day, especially when I need it, even when I don't. Amen. The resurrection of Lazarus set the plot to arrest Jesus into high gear. Pharisees and even members of the Sanhedrin are beginning to put their trust in Jesus Christ. And while that happens, the, the Jewish leaders retreat to Jerusalem and begin to plan for the arrest and the death of Jesus Christ. John wrote, Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life, not only Jesus' life, but Lazarus as well. The chief priests and the Pharisees gave orders that if anyone found Jesus, they should report it so that Jesus could be arrested. Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the Jews. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the desert, to a village called Ephraim. And while in Ephraim, Jesus has a conversation with, with, a, with a person that tells us a lot about Jesus' thoughts about wealth and about evangelism and about the cost of becoming a disciple. What do we know about this young man that, that Jesus encounters? Well, first of all, we know, we know that he is young, and we know that he is described as being very rich. Uh, Luke tells us that he's not only rich, but he's a, he's a powerful person. He is a ruler. Um, perhaps he achieved his, his position of power as a result of, of being uh, very wealthy. He's either a member of one of the religious councils or perhaps a local uh, magistrate of some sort. We know that the person that Jesus is encountering is serious about his faith and his religion. He, he says that he's been, he's been disciplined to keeping the law and honoring the laws of the Old Testament. <clears throat> we know that he is intent to the point of possibly even being desperate. We're told that he, he doesn't just saunter up to Jesus. He doesn't just come to Jesus but it says that he ran to Jesus and bowed down. He's unlike many who ask Jesus questions. Many of the other people who come to Jesus with questions were, were people who were trying to trick Christ or they were trying to trap him into saying something controversial. But this young man is intent. He's desperate to get the answer to his question. He recognizes that Jesus is a good teacher. Some versions of the, of the scriptures will say master. The word master is a word that was used to describe senior rabbis or people who had a reputation for being able to teach the scriptures and to teach the law. We know that he is a Pharisee because he believes in some sort of eternal life. The two major groups at the time were Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Sadducees were the, um, were the religious uh, liberals of the day who didn't believe in the resurrection and didn't believe in the miracles, but, but viewed Jesus as merely, uh, or, or viewed, uh, viewed the law as their primary source of, of instruction and had no, uh, no allegiance to Jesus at all and did not believe in a resurrection. Again, he's, he's like Nicodemus and he comes in a spirit of sincerity. He wants to know the answer to this question. The, the conversation begins like this, Teacher, what good thing must I do to take hold of eternal life? If you're looking at the context in which this occurs, the, the, this, this encounter occurs right after the case where the disciples are trying to keep the children from coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. 
And the, the rich young ruler is asking, what do I need to do to take part in this kingdom of heaven stuff? His understanding of eternal life at this time would be uh, Israel back on top. The Roman rulers are, are vanquished. The Messiah arrives and, and rules forever. That's how he, his understanding of eternal life would be shaped. To take hold of the kingdom of heaven, uh, that, that was a, a, a question that was much deba debated among the Jewish leaders. They loved to sit around and discuss who's in and who's out. How do you earn God's favor in the system that they had? And there, were, there were four main things that they liked to talk about. One was some thought you had to obey all of the rules. All the, you, you need to obey every rule, and if you obey every rule, you're going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. You'll be in the in crowd. Others like to divide the rules up, and they, and they had a list of rules, and it was like these rules you, you can get away with breaking but these are the rules that you have to keep in order to be in the kingdom of heaven. Some thought that you had to recite certain prayers or spend a certain amount of time caring for the elderly. But there were all of these different theories of what a person had to do to take hold of the kingdom of heaven. There's no consensus, and this young man may have been legitimately confused. He hears all of these different opinions he, he wants to be in, and he comes to Jesus recognizing that he is someone who speaks with authority, and he asks him a question. Jesus responds to the young man like this. His, his response runs counter to everything we have been taught about evangelism. I've taken different courses in, in how to win people to Christ, and Jesus does everything wrong in this encounter. He doesn't say, well, acknowledge your sin or, or ask me into your heart. He doesn't respond by referring to, to Galatians, which hadn't been written yet, but, but, but say, he doesn't say it's a matter of faith and grace alone. His response surprises us. Jesus never behaves or, or never says or behaves in a manner that suggests, let me make this easy for you. He never does that when people approach him with questions like this. Jesus' goal is not to rack up decisions, but rather to attract disciples. He wants to attract people who will, will take his teachings to heart and, and apply them to how they live. Jesus seems to be the least persuasive evangelist ever. His approach always seems to be, here it is, you can take it or you can leave it. He never twists arms. He never focuses on the ease of becoming a follower, and he always focuses on the cost. I love what a favorite writer of mine, Dallas Willard, says about the cost of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Willard said, the only thing greater than the cost of becoming a disciple of Christ is the cost of not becoming one. Jesus goes on to give a fourfold response to this young man's question about what he must do to take hold of eternal life. First, Jesus says, why do you say that I am good? No one is good except God alone. Now, our response to a, a question like this, what must I do to eternal life, would not have been that. We would ha have quickly tried to seal the deal um, and get them to say something or, or do something to, to acknowledge some type of commitment, but that is not the response of Christ. But our personal salvation is part of a broader story that God is telling story of God taking on human form and then dying on the cross to launch a radically different kind of kingdom. One that would fulfill all of the promises of the Old Testament. The, the promise of a heel that would crush the head of Satan. The, the promise of a nation that would be a blessing to the entire world. And, and the promise of a benevolent king 
who once taking his throne would never give it up, who would rule forever. That's the story that's being told. Here's what Jesus seems to be saying in his response when he says, why do you say that I'm good? No one is good except God. A couple of points. One is he's saying there isn't any good thing you can do to take hold of life. Taking hold of eternal life is not a matter of finding the right good thing to do or of doing the right amount of good things or of always doing the good things. Jesus is calling his attention to that. I think another part of Jesus' response is he's making the point that it isn't enough to recognize Jesus as just a good teacher. By, By saying that no one is good except God alone, Jesus is leading this young man through an argument or discussion that presents where he is presenting himself as the Son of Man, as God himself. Then Jesus says another thing that is an affront to how we have been taught to do evangelism. He says, well, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, just keep all the commandments. Martin Luther would have thrown Jesus out of the church for an answer like that. On the surface, it stands in direct contrast to everything Paul later taught about salvation. All of us who have been shaped by the Protestant Reformation or studied the books of Romans or Galatians should be shocked by Jesus' response. Jesus doesn't seem to know how to do evangelism. He seems to give the rich young man the wrong answer. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the works of the law, we become conscious of our sin. Writing to the Christians in Galatians, he wrote, Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith. Not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Jesus is not providing direct answers to the young man's questions. He's trying to lead him through a conversation that will change his heart. In response to Jesus' comment on keeping the commandments, the rich young man asks, which ones? Which ones do I need to keep? And Jesus' response is very interesting. His question may have been a sincere question, or he may have been looking for some some moral wiggle room. I'll, I'll keep these, but I'm not so sure about those. Here's how Jesus responds. If you want to take hold of eternal life, don't murder commit adultery, steal, defraud, give false testimony, or dishonor your parents. And love your neighbor as yourself. In the Ten Commandments, there are are four commandments that deal with how we approach God. And there are six commandments that focus on how we treat our fellow man. For some reason, Jesus leaves out the four commandments focused on how we relate to God. He's shifting the attention to how we treat our fellow man. Another thing that is interesting is that he omits one of the six commandments that deals with how we treat our fellow man. One of the commandments was do not covet, and Jesus replaces it with the commandment do not defraud. Perhaps this young man was so wealthy, there was nothing for him to covet. Perhaps he had gained some of his wealth by defrauding his fellow man. But then Jesus goes on and he he picks an obscure law from the book of Leviticus. One that Jesus would eventually elevate to, to one of the most important two laws that a person can keep. Love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus' response doesn't cut through the young man's self-righteousness. 
the rich young man, instead of saying, well, I failed to love my neighbor as much as I should, he basically says, great, I've got this. What more do I lack? I've done all that. Is there anything else I need to do? Jesus' response differs starkly from other Jewish teachers who came up with longer and longer sets of rules. While, while others make it complex, Jesus makes it simple. He, he cuts to the very chase of what's going on in this young man's heart. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus essentially said, you will experience forever life when you let go of things and put God ahead of everything else. N.T. Wright wrote in his commentary on Matthew, Jesus doesn't often seem to have told people to give up everything and follow him. When he did it, it was either because, in the case of the twelve, he wanted them to be free so that they could be with him at all times and share in his work, or because, in the case of this young man, he sensed that his possessions had become his idol, his alternative God, the demon that would kill him unless he renounced it. Wright continued to say, we all have something like that in our lives. It may not be material possessions. It is up to us to examine our hearts and lives to see what it is that is holding us back from serving God with the completeness that Jesus longs for. The point of this message is to, to motivate all of us to examine our hearts and to ask, what is it in my life that is holding me back? What is keeping me from embracing Christ as my Lord and Messiah in a way that will lead to completeness spiritually? Anything that comes between us and God diminishes our ability to experience the kingdom of heaven. For some, it may be leisure. For others, it may be sports or family or, or political interests. There, there are all kinds of things that can become idols in our lives, things that we worship more than we worship the Lord. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? The disciples are confused. The, 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 the consensus of the day is that the, the wealthy people are the ones who are in. The, the rich and powerful are certainly the ones who will enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what about the rest of us? Jesus looked at them and he said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And then Peter answered him, Jesus, we, we, we have left everything to follow you. What then is there going to be for us? Jesus said to them, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fills for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. I think there are three lessons in this story 
for us to take away with us. The first lesson is that while salvation is free, there is a cost to becoming a disciple of Christ. I think at times we are guilty of trying to make following Christ too easy. Jesus never did that. But there's a cost to being obedient. There are things that we must give up. It will take us out of our comfort zone. It will stretch us and convict us. Second lesson that we get from the story is that giving to the poor is a measure of our commitment to Jesus. Time and time and time again, Jesus comes back to this point. If you want to practice true righteousness, take care of the people around you who are most in need. Jesus' half-brother James wrote to the Christians in Jerusalem that, that true religion was taking care of the widows and the fatherless. It's giving of ourselves to make life better for vulnerable people, for the people who live on the edges, not enjoying the comforts of life that we do. But giving to the poor is a measure of our commitment to Jesus. I remember hearing this one time <clears throat> while I was driving down the road and, a, and a, a speaker on the radio made this point. And I thought to myself, Carl, how much did you give to the poor this year? And I was convicted. <laughs> and, and I was ashamed at, at how low the amount was question for all of us to ask right now, not how much have we given to the church or how much have we given to that, but how much have we given to the poor this year? A question that, that tests the measure of our discipleship. Not, but it, doesn't, it doesn't merely test the measure of our discipleship, but it has the potential to lead us deeper into the experience of the kingdom of heaven. There is a joy in giving. There is a fulfillment that comes from serving people in need that nothing can match. Because when we do, our lives are reflecting the life of Christ and lining up with the kingdom of heaven. While salvation is free, there is a cost to becoming a disciple. Giving to the poor is a measure of our commitment to Jesus. And then finally, God exorbitantly rewards those who develop the heart of a giver. Jesus promises a 100% return. I don't know anyone who at the end of their life has looked back and said, I wished I had given less. Uh, let us as followers of Christ be willing to pay the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, we can't outgive God. He will exorbitantly reward whatever we do. But, but most important is the fact that, that, like Christ, we have a heart for people who are in need and are willing to sacrifice of our own, sacrifice of ourselves to meet it. We close with, with a word of prayer. Father, I, we ask, I ask that your Holy Spirit would examine our hearts right now. Lord, I, I pray that each one of us who is listening to the service would ask, how much have I given to the poor this year? Help us to develop the heart of Christ. Lord, help us not to merely recognize him as a good teacher, but, but to recognize him as our Lord, our God, one who deserves our full allegiance. Lord, help us not to be merely believers, but to become disciples, people who study the life of Christ and, and, and work to make it a part of who we are on a daily basis. Father, we pray for people in need. We pray for people who have been living on the streets. We pray for people who are struggling with addictions. Lord, we pray for people who are unemployed and, and, and worried about how they're going to meet the next month's bills. Lord, I pray that you would bring these people to our attention and help us to respond with hearts that bring praise and glory to your name. We ask this in Christ's name. Beast.
still and know that I'm with you. Be still and know that I am here. Be still and know that I'm with you. Be still, be still. One reason that we can't outgive God is because He gave His very Son for the forgiveness of our sins. We come to the table now, focusing our thoughts on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, remembering that He allowed His body to be broken, He shed His blood so that our sins could be forgiven. And when God forgives our sins, He casts them as far as the east is tosses them behind his back or throws them into the deepest part of the ocean because Christ's death has paid the price for our sin. I'm going to read a passage of scripture and then I'll say a prayer and then we will take the bread and the cup together uh, proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank <clears throat> you. 
Father, we come to you this morning thankful for the bread that reminds us of the broken body of Jesus Christ. Father, we come with gratitude for the cup, uh, reminding us as we drink it that Christ's blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, we humble ourselves, proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ. We confess that we are broken and sinful people. We confess that there are times we are not willing to pay the cost of being a disciple. Father, work in our hearts to shape us to be like Jesus. Father, we are so, so grateful that we stand before you today clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your unfailing love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the bread, remembering Christ's broken body, and drink the cup, remembering his blood shed for the remission of our sins. you so much for joining us for, for worship today. Hey, one month from today, we will be back here in the sanctuary, face-to-face, uh, -face, worshiping Christ together. I'm so looking forward to that, as I know many of you are. Hey, let's leave today examining our hearts. Let's leave asking God to open our eyes to people who are in need and to open our hearts to respond. Hey, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I uh, look forward to seeing you back here next week and seeing you in person here uh, one month.